old North Carolina, I must leave you all alone. I'm gonna cross that Blue Ridge Mountain, East Kentucky will be my home. Hey guys, I thought that'd be a great introduction to get us in the mood for some early banjo history. I don't have a whole lot of time with y'all, so I'm going to jump right into it. Um, I'm just going to use a, a basic sources for this. Um, I want y'all, I want to turn y'all on to this book. This is one of the first books about the banjo, if not the first book about the banjo that I ever read and got my hands on. It's called America's Instrument. The Banjo in the 19th Century. This was put out by University of North Carolina Press back in 1999 by Philip Gura and James Bowman. This is a great place to start. It's got a lot of tons of, it's all color photographs of actual artifacts and then old black and white photos of like wet plate photograph, photographs and stuff. There's a lot of uh, information about menstrual banjo and stuff in here, but uh, you know, most pertinent, what I'm most interested in is the early stuff in here. And they kind of, like most people, there's not a lot of information about the, the early uh, roots of the five-string banjo before the Civil War, before the minstrels uh, co-opted the banjo and took it on stage. That, that's a murky area, and we're, you know, we're going to talk about that at length, hopefully. Uh, but this, they, they give you some great information, a basic outline of sort of the Afro-Caribbean origins and what some of the different instruments were like. Uh, another book that came out more recently was The Banjo, and that came out uh, in Harvard University Press by Lorraine Dubois, and that was 2016. I bought and read that book when it first came out. Um, it's called The Banjo, I think it's called The Banjo, America's African Instrument. And he has a lot of great information, too, about the early, the process of like how all these different slaves, uh, enslaved African people from all these different... Um, African countries, mostly West Afri African countries, uprooted, taken over to the Caribbean, and how they um, built these instruments, built new instruments, in some cases even brought instruments over, but mostly built new instruments and had to communicate with each other, if not through verbal language, through music. Um, and, and then these new instruments came out of that, and they sort of, they, they, it's like they went through a bottleneck. All these folk instruments that were very similar to very similar sort of stringed, gourded, like gourds with hides on them. There was lots of them, but they kind of went through a bottleneck from slavery, and, and what came out the other end of the bottleneck was, was the banjo. So, and so Dubois' book is pretty interesting about that process, um, how they took all these different folk instruments, and they came up with one basic thing that was called the banji, or the banza, or the banjir, banjil, had a bunch of different names, Strum Strum, a Mary Wang. They called it a lot of different stuff in the 1600s and the early 1700s. Um, but the basic concept was it was built around a gourd drum, a gourd with a hide stretched over it and a hardwood neck. And it had anywhere from one to three long strings and always the one short string. So that's, that's the banjo. And, and you, the first time you really see like reference to that in North America, in the United States, is in the 1700s. That's when, in the middle, early to middle 1700s, um, based on these books and stuff that I've been, that I've read over the years, that's when you first see references of uh, enslaved black people, um, Africans, who didn't, and they even mentioned that they didn't even speak English and stuff, playing the banjo. And the only reason we know about them is from uh, criminal records or newspaper um, broadsides for runaway, looking for runaway slaves and stuff. And they mentioned that, hey, this is my slave so-and-so ran away from me and he was dressed like this. He doesn't speak very good English. He plays the banjo and sings. And uh, those go back to, you know, at least 1750 and, and maybe a little bit earlier. Um, so the re earliest references we have are basically criminal records and uh, stuff from newspapers. So you know it was going on a lot earlier. They had the, and, and when they mentioned the banjo in these, the earliest accounts of the banjo we have from those colonial newspapers and stuff, they mention it very casually. They don't say, this thing called a banjo that I just saw today or just heard about. They say, he plays a banjo. Everybody knows what it is. Everybody who reads the newspaper knows what it is. 
and it's known as an instrument of the lower classes. Going back to well before 1800, there is, you know, people mention the banjo and they say not just that it, usually they say it's, a, it's an African instrument played by the slaves, but there's some accounts where the person in a diary or a journal they wrote or dictionary they've compiled later, circa 1800 or so, they describe the banjo as the instrument of the lower classes. The lower classes in the 18th century weren't just black people. It was everybody. Slaves, indentured servants, uh, journeymen, apprentices, soldiers, um, and, and lowly frontier pioneer people who made their money by scraping hides um, or, or making, you know, selling charcoal and stuff out on the frontier. These were the lower classes. They were black, they were white, they were often sometimes Native American, and they were all three mixed. So we know that, that, that black people and lower class whites uh, were, were living together side by side as early as, you know, the earliest slaves that came into Jamestown in, what was that, 1619. The first Africans were brought into Jamestown. And uh, we know that they were on the same social status as the white servants. They lived in the same quarters, etc. Um, so anyhow, we, so we know that, and, and the earliest banjo reference of a black person playing the banjo is in the 1700s, in the middle 1700s. So it's pretty safe to say that by 1750, the banjo was commonplace all over the colony of South Carolina, North Carolina, all over Virginia, all over Maryland. It was commonplace. Um, everybody knew what it was. And we also know, this is well documented, um, that early black slaves, as early as, I think, 1770, the late, you know, the 1770s, Monk Estelle, who traveled with Daniel Boone, he was a, a, a pretty famous black violin player, and that was in the 1770s. Another famous black violin player is Cato Watts. These guys were both in the mountains of Kentucky in the 1770s. So we know that blacks had, had acquired the violin and by 1770. And we know that black people had, had brought the banjo to widespread, you know, everybody knew about it by about 1750, it seems, in the South and certainly on the frontier. Um, so when do we have the, when did the first white person pick up the banjo and start playing? Most popular histories that you find on the internet or in books will tell you that it was, you know, Joel Sweeney in East Virginia, whose father was a plantation owner. They'll say that he was the first white man to play banjo. Uh, you know, he may be, the, he's the first white man that is documented playing the banjo. But, you know, contemporaneous with, with Joel Sweeney was another white banjo player named Archibald Ferguson, who was an Appalachian. He lived in, in, uh, in, in, the, in the mountains. And that's documented when he taught the banjo to Dan Emmett in like 1840 or something. So we know that by 1830, white men, at least two of them, were playing the banjo in Virginia and up in the mountains, I guess, in Western Virginia, you know, area. So we know that, but and it's the earliest reference of any white person having anything directly to do with the banjo comes from, is that I found in this article by George Gibson in 2000. He put out this, the banjo in Appalachia. So in this, the earliest reference that I can find, that I guess that anybody can find, is in this article Sorry guys, it's on the next page. Here we go. There's a guy named Dr. Daniel Drake. And he was, he was one of the earliest doctors on the frontier in Kentucky. And he wrote, he published a, a memoir of his pioneer years out in, in Maysville, Kentucky from 1788 to 1800. And he describes one of his neighbors, who we, we have to presume is white because he, he calls him Mr. Rector. So I don't think he was, he, um, I'm, I'm just assuming that this guy was white because he probably would have mentioned that he was black or mixed race if he wasn't. So this is probably a white guy, Mr. Rector. And I'll just read directly from, from uh, Gibson's article here. Uh, Dr. Daniel Drake's letters to his children, published in Pioneer Life in Kentucky, describes in detail his boyhood near Maysville, Kentucky in the years 1788 to 1800. 
Mr. Rector, a neighbor whom Dr. Drake refers to as, quote, old leather stocking, depended mostly on hunting and trapping for his livelihood. Dr. Drake recounts, quote, deer hunting seemed to have been old leather stocking's cherished pursuit. Its result were clothing, food, and fiddle strings for the banjo. So that right there in black and white is a pre-1800 reference in the Kentucky frontier of what is presumably what I would safely assume is a white man making banjo strings out of deer intestine. So why is this white deer skinner, deer hunter, this, this long rifle guy making banjo strings? So only one of two reasons. Either he is he plays banjo himself and he is the first white banjo player that we know of in the entire history of the banjo, this Mr. Rector, old leather stocking, or he was making banjo strings because he sold them or traded them or gave them to somebody, a black neighbor, and he is not the first black banjo player. But that tells me that well before 1800, um, and also, think of this, the way that Dr. Drake mentions the banjo. He just drops it. He just drops the word. And making fiddle strings for the banjo. The banjo, he doesn't describe what it is. He doesn't say who plays it, who doesn't play it. It's a common instrument by 1800, all the way out west, what was then the west, the wild west, up in eastern Kentucky, east Tennessee, western Virginia, western Carolina, up in the backcountry in the mountains. It was already a commonplace instrument. And we know that one white man is already making banjo strings circa 1790.